book of Proverbs and chapter number 24. Proverbs chapter 24 tonight. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That book you got in your hand will outlast what you see with your eyes. You look up in that sky at night, go up in that sky and look down on this earth, it'll all be gone one day. But the Bible stands. Bibles, praise the Lord. All right, Proverbs 24, verse number 30. I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns. And nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. What did he learn? Get a little sleep. A little slumber. A little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. And thy want as an armed man. Let's pray together tonight. Our Father, I ask that you would help me. Lord, I, I, I need, I need the truth that's contained in the portion of your word that we will look at tonight. I pray, God, that you'd help me to minister truth. I pray that each and every one that's come tonight will receive truth that we'll all be the better for having come tonight because you helped us and you met with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe the greatest and most destructive lie, the one that has done the most damage to our nation, is the theory taught and embraced of evolution. Not only is it a religion that denies the very existence of Almighty God, but the outworking of that system of faith, the outworking of that belief, brings ruin to an individual, to a family, to a nation, certainly to a church. The man in the passage that we are considering tonight appears to have been something of an evolutionist. He's certainly a man that rejected the Word of God. He believed that thorns wouldn't grow in ground that he had cultivated. He believed that weeds would not overtake a vineyard in which he had labored. He did not believe that a wall needed to be maintained. He believed that over time it might just get stronger and stronger if he just ignored it and let it be. And yet what the the wise man who walked by and stopped to observe, what he saw was that while a man slept just a little, while a man slumbered just a little, while a man said, I'm not asleep, but had folded his hands and assumed the idle position of one who was asleep, he noticed that weeds kept on doing what weeds do. He noticed that nettles just kept on doing what nettles do. He noticed that time and decay and rot and ruin and waste and damage just kept traveling. They just kept moving on. And as he pondered and considered what he had seen, the wise man was instructed by a holy God. And he said... And put it in writing so that we could see it. He said, time won't stop just because you do. Sin won't stop just because you stop fighting it. The devil won't stop trying to destroy just because you get tired of fighting him. Your flesh won't stop trying to draw you astray just because you don't feel like praying today. There's nothing in this passage about bad men coming by and tearing down the wall. There's nothing in this passage like the one we read the other night about an enemy coming and sowing nettles in this man's field. There's no adversary here. There's no opposing force. 
There is no opposition in the passage. It's the course of nature in a fallen world versus diligence or idleness on the other side. I say to you, time never takes time off. I say to you, the carnal nature never goes on vacation. I say to you, the devil never gets up in the morning and says, I just don't feel like attacking today. And what, what is required for the ruin of your family, what is required for the loss of your testimony, what is required for this great church to become one more washout is not a great attack by the devil. It's you just believing that everything's going so good, it's going to run itself and just keep going so good. What is, what is necessary tonight for you to go from active church member to absentee church member is not some terrible crisis or tragedy in your life. It's just a little folding of the hands to slumber. I've read the Bible so many times. I know the Bible so well. I don't need to spend time with the Bible today. One day's neglect of God's Word won't hurt me. That might be true if on that same day, no one on your job cursed. No one on your job displayed themselves immodestly. No advertiser promoted alcohol and booze. No no music came over a PA system somewhere where you were doing business, calling you back to the life you'd left behind. If, if the world would take a day off, then you could take a day off. If the flesh would take a day off, then you could take a day off. If the devil would just stay in bed, then you could stay in bed. But I must be diligent every day to tend to my garden because the weeds are going to do what weeds do. The insects are going to do what insects do. The thorns and briars are going to do what the thorns and briars do. We bought some property years ago. I, my son was two. My daughter had just been born. and We bought uh, uh, ten acres of, of just, just undeveloped uh, woods and, and cut a driveway in there and cleared a little spot and built a little house on it. And I'd come home from work in the evening and spend an hour or two out there with a chainsaw and a and a and a mattock, some of you know what that is, and a and an axe, and just chop out a little piece of that ground and clear it and stack it up and burn it and go out the next day and, and spend an hour out there and just chop and clear a little piece of that land. You know, little by little, we get all those briar patches out. We got all those old nasty palmettos out that grow down there in Florida. We just rooted all those things out and cleared it before long. We had pasture land. Put the fence around it, put some cows on it. Well, the church grew. Hallelujah. More people in the church. More visits to make. More prayers to pray. More counseling to do. More church services. And before long, we saw those cows walk up a ramp into a trailer and head off to that great hamburger patch in the sky. And it wasn't long until the little shoots of palmettos came back up. And it wasn't long before a little piece of a briar stuck its head up out of the ground. And I'm telling you, if you go out there now, seven, eight years after those cows said goodbye, we watched them head off down the driveway with a tear in their eye. You'd never know there'd been a pasture there. You couldn't, you couldn't graze. You couldn't hardly graze a goat in there the way that thing's overgrown. Now, nobody came out and wrecked it. Nobody came out and and turned it back to what it was before. That's just the course that it's on. It just does that. Weeds ever grew there, weeds will always grow there. Grass ever grew there, grass will always grow there. If lust was ever in your heart, lust will be in your heart till you die. Temptation ever got a hold on you, temptation will keep getting a hold on you till the day you die. I'm telling you, this thing isn't evolving or changing from one state to another. Unless you interfere, it keeps going like it's always gone, and as soon as you stop interfering, it'll go that way again. The heart, the Bible doesn't say the heart was deceitful above all things. 
The heart is deceitful above all things. The Bible doesn't say the heart was desperately wicked before you got saved. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. This very night, your heart desires what it always desired. Your mind tends toward what it always tended toward. Your flesh has an appetite for what it always had an appetite for tonight. Jesus said you must be born again. Having been born again, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That's never changed. That's never changed. Your flesh can no more be trusted tonight than the first time you ever walked through the doors of a church. Your heart, your thoughts can no more be trusted tonight than the very first time you ever heard a preacher preach from the Bible. I'll tell you what people do. They do it in our church. They do it in your church. They do it in good Bible preaching churches all over America. They sit there for a while excited. They sit there for a while blessed. They get involved. They participate. They sell out and want to live for Jesus. Then they put it in neutral. And they coast a while. And they're just as excited as they were, but they're not fueling that fire. And they're just as interested as they were, but they're not recharging that battery. And then before long, before long, that preaching... All of a sudden, it sounds like it's against me, not for me. That music, all of a sudden, it, it sounds like it's, it's bothering me, not blessing me. And, you, and so you know what people start doing? People that once said, the Bible says. People that once said, the Scripture says. People that once said, well, I can't do that because the Word of God says. They begin to say, I just feel the Lord leading me. I just, I just have peace about it. When the Lord's leading you and what the Lord's leading you to do doesn't match what God said in His Word, your flesh has reassumed control of your garden. The briars have taken over your vineyard. And the reason you're trying to get peace in your heart about something is because you can't get peace with God looking at His book. People come, you know, they'll, they'll say to me, and then, then they'll say to people on the telephone, and then they'll say to people on the, uh, type it on the face plant, you know, after they leave. They'll say, well, we, just, we prayed about it, and, and, and God led us to leave. It's funny, He never led you to tithe. He never led you to visitation. He never led you to prayer meeting. You never one time heard His voice when a missionary was asking for help. You never one time heard his voice when a new ministry was getting started. But as soon as something inside you said, I think you ought to leave, it was God and you were out the door. You can have peace about anything if you only consult yourself. You know what this foolish man did? He thought that because he'd cleared the ground, he'd stay clear forever. He thought because he'd cut down all the briars, there'd never be briars there again. He thought because he'd put up a wall to keep the foxes and the, and the varmints out, that they'd never get through that wall. And so he began to be careless, and he began to be idle. And I ask you tonight, brother, and I'm not, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm asking you in your heart, in your heart, just you, just you and God. Was there a time in your life when you'd have never gone to that website and you're going there now? You're still sitting in church. You're still singing the songs. You're still smiling and shaking hands in fellowship. Listen, you know how to make your garden look like it's a okay. But I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost knows there's some weeds popping up in there. And once they start popping up, they'll take, they'll take that ground over quite quicker than you know. Sister, let me ask you something. And, 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 uh, and honestly, this is just, just between you and God. No show of hands. You don't have to say a thing to me. But why in the world are you sitting up nights 
typing in names of boys you knew 30 years ago to find out what they're doing now. What do you care what they're doing now? Don't you have a husband? Why are you looking up the old briars to see if maybe they still got some roots in your vineyard? I'm telling you, in good churches, with a Bible in their lap, People sit in pews and backslide. And we know how to cover it up. And we know how to look right. But I'm telling you, that wall is not going to stand forever undamaged. You've got to patch it. Roots are going to, are going to force, knock into it and start cracking it a little bit here and there. And, 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 uh, trees will fall down on it, knock a part of it over. And, and, and those things just happen. Might be chance, it might be circumstance, it might be a storm, it, it might be the shifting and shaking of the ground, it might just be time, but that wall's gonna start to crumble. You gotta maintain that thing. I don't believe in evolution. Some church people do. They think the church restrooms clean themselves. They think the church carpet vacuums itself. They come to dinner on the grounds and fellowship and they pile their plate high and they eat it and they go to the dessert room, pile their plate high and eat it and then just take off and go home like everything's going to clean up all by itself. They believe in evolution. They, they think the garbage jumps in the garbage cans and the bags tie themselves shut and the bags jump out of the trash can and fly out and get in the dumpster. They do. I'm telling you, somebody's got to clean up every single time. Somebody's got to patch up every single time. I thank God we got children all over our church. I do. I, I thank the Lord. We, we got babies and toddlers and, and five-year-olds. I mean, just every size and shape and variety you can, you can imagine. This little girl came up the other morning. She came walking in church, showed me that two of her teeth had fallen out. And, and I said, I, I just made some kind of comment, and I called her by her name. And she stopped me. She said, that is not my name. My name is Princess. And her, her mother said, her mother said, I hope that doesn't bother you. I said, it only bother me if her brother said it. <laughs> Listen, I like having all those children around the church. But you know something? Hardly a Sunday goes by that somebody hadn't taken an ink pen or a marker to a hymnal. Hardly a Sunday goes by that somebody hadn't scattered gospel tracts all over the backyard. Hardly a Sunday goes by that, that something isn't broken. Something isn't missing. Something isn't torn up. Listen, I'd, I'd rather that than no children in the church. But you know something? If you don't fix, if you don't fix, if you don't repair every single week, that building, on, it'll be torn all to pieces in three years. There'll be nothing left of it. You, every, every window in the, thing, in the place will be broken. Every door will be busted. Every door handle will be hanging. It's just, it's true. You know what you got to do? You can't just build something like this. You got to maintain it. You know that's so. You can sit here and say, "Man, I like the colors. I like the lights. I like the platform. The choir loft looks good. It's just so beautiful. It won't be in 24 months. You're gonna be touching up paint every week. You're gonna be polishing marks every week. You're gonna be fixing up this and fixing up every single week. You, isn't that true? You got a car? Praise the Lord. Look, I got a car. Woo! You get that car. You know what you do? First week, you wash it. Second week, you wash it. Fourth week, you wash it. Eighth week, you wash it. Six months later, you wash it. Year and a half later, you get the kid to wash it. Hey, we're all excited about something new. We're not excited about maintaining it. We're all excited about getting something valuable. We're not excited about taking care of it. You got new life in Jesus Christ. Isn't that exciting? I'm telling you, your flesh is not going to want to take care of it. It's work to maintain that thing. It's easy to go out and buy a car. It's easy to go out and buy a house. It's hard to take care of it. Isn't that right? You get married, boy, there you are. I do, I do, no, I really do, no, I really do, I double do, I triple do. And you mean it. Because you think he's going to keep acting like he's been acting while he was dating you. 
but he's not. And you hadn't seen her yet. You think she's pretty, but a lot of that comes off. I got this cartoon. This woman's talking on the phone, and she's she's standing there. She just, I mean, she just smooth right up here, and she got this thing in her hand. She's on the phone. She said, "I can't come out this afternoon. I'm washing my hair." You know, is... I hope I didn't hurt anybody's feelings. I didn't mean it to. I'm just telling you, you these bodies, you got to maintain them. Your property, you got to maintain it. You got a lawnmower, what a cursed thing. I tell you, the, the only thing more, more of the devil than a lawnmower is a tractor. The only thing more, more of the devil than a tractor is a chainsaw. I'm telling you, man, you may, you may, if you, you want to use chainsaw, just go buy a new one every time. Because one you used last time, it ain't starting. And then you take it down to shop, you know, or call one of your Christian friends. Hey, I know how to fix stuff. He'll come over and pull the cord, start right up. He gets in the truck and drives away. It quits, won't start again. About to make you cuss. <laughs> Lawn mowers. They're just they're just of the devil. My dad come home. He said, "If that yard ain't cut, and I come home, I'm gonna whip you, boy." And this is back in the day when there was no hotline. They'd just whip you. And I'd get home from school. I'd try and try and try and try that more. wouldn't start. I'm crying. You know, my mom's out there. Well, maybe, son, maybe if you prayed. Pray. I prayed to every God I've ever heard of, man. <laughs> God, Jehovah, Zeus, you know, <laughs> Geronimo. <laughs> my dad come home, you know. He'd get in there and go out in the garage. And he'd hear that mower start up. Make you just want to jump off a cliff, you know. You got to maintain stuff. It falls apart. How's your prayer life? How's your Bible reading? How's your witnessing? Well, I've done. Yeah, we've all done it. This man, this man cleared a field. This man planted a vineyard. This man staked them out. This man grew the grapes. This man put a wall all around it. Then he got just sitting on the porch with his hands folded. The pastor will do it. Somebody else would do it. Church is big now. There's all kind of people can help. I don't need to be as involved as I used to be. I don't need to be as busy as I used to be. I tell you, the whole thing will fall apart quicker than you know. You see these houses, people move out of them. Foreclosures and that sort of thing. People move out. You go by that house six months later, a year later, two years later. It's unbelievable. What happens to a house? Just because nobody's keeping it up. Nobody's taking care of it. Turn your Bible to 1 Peter. 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 1 Peter 5, 2 Peter 3. 1 Peter chapter 5, 2 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter 5, 2 Peter 3. There's a word in the Bible. It's an important word. Key word. 1 Peter 5, verse number 9. One's about the enemy. 1 Peter 5, verse number 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. That's, that's have your right mind about you. Keep your eyes open. Be on the lookout. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He didn't say resist him. He said, resist him steadfast, steady, Fa- fast to be steady, in a hurry to be on guard, in a hurry have your eyes open, in a hurry have your heart right, consistently, faithfully, day after day, knowing the devil's not on vacation. My heart can't be on vacation. The devil's not goofing off today. My soul and spirit can't goof off today. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about, walketh about. He's on the move. He's always on the move. That man in Proverbs 30, you know what he found out? 
poverty, poverty just kept on coming. Poverty didn't say, if you stop, I'll stop. Poverty kept on coming till one day it showed up at his house. I'm telling you, the devil's going to keep on coming till one day he shows up at your house. Young man, listen to me. Young lady, please, listen. I know, we, 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 all, we treat you like you're stupid. You, you think, he, he thinks I know him, brings my head. Listen, I'm just telling you. Some of you, the only spirituality you got is your pastor's. The only spiritual interest you have belongs to your Sunday school teacher and your youth worker. The only convictions you have belong to your mother and your father. The re- Listen, everything you've got is either secondhand or forced on you. And I'm telling you, the devil is not going to sign a peace treaty with you. The devil's not going to say, if you don't get serious about God, I won't get serious about you. If you promise you won't live for Jesus, I'll just let you alone. He's not going to let you alone. Because he wants your father, he wants your mother, he wants your pastor, he wants your church, he wants your brother, he wants your sister. And if he can't get them, he'll get you and break their hearts with you. Just because you've grown up in a good church doesn't mean you're not as close to the world as a person growing up in an unsaved household that never goes to church. It's in your heart. You've got to stand against that thing. You've got to be sober. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to be steadfast. We get these fellows come down our way... And, and they come to Bible school because they want to be a missionary. They come to Bible school they want to be, be a pastor of a church. And man, they get there and they're all fired up. They're, they're up early praying. They're memorizing scripture. They're going out street preaching. They're going out on visitation. They're early for class. They got their notebook, their computers all right. And man, they are fired up. But three months later, they're fired down because they're sleepy and they're tired. And it's the only thing harder than going to school and working at McDonald's is going to school and working at McDonald's having eaten at McDonald's. Their brains are turning into grease and their arteries are clogging and their their eyes are tired. And, And you know what they're finding out? There's more to this thing than learning Bible. There's more to this thing than witnessing to lost people. There's more than this thing than coming to church and singing songs. You gotta learn to keep going when you're exhausted. You gotta learn to do right when you don't feel like it. You gotta learn to, to, to labor in a vineyard on days when it's hot and days when it's cold, and days when it's raining, and days when it's sunny, and days when there's no fruit on the vine, and days when the vine is full of fruit, because the weeds don't stop, and the thorns don't stop, and the foxes don't stop, and the wolves don't stop, and the weather doesn't stop. You can't stop! What's going to get you? Listen, that nobody's going to leave this church because they decide to go NIV. That's not what's going to get you. What's going to get you is you got tired of forgiving. You got tired of being long-suffering. You got tired of not being the center of attention. And you quit keeping your heart right. And then all of a sudden, then the preacher just don't preach as good as he used to. He preaches exactly like he used to. Well, you know, the singing just just doesn't kind of do what it used to do. It's doing exactly what it used to do. It's just not reaching your heart. Listen, listen. You can sit right here and miss everything that's going on. And the person sitting right beside you is getting every bit of it. Don't tell me church has changed. The person beside you doesn't think it's changed. The one behind you doesn't think it's changed. The one in front of you doesn't think it's changed. Church hadn't changed. You just got weeds growing up. You got briars growing up. You haven't maintained your wall. Look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter 3. The Bible says in verse number, all the way down, verse number 14. 2 Peter 3, 14. Wherefore, beloved... Seeing that you look for such things. Now what things is he talking about? 
Look at this. Verse 11, the dissolving of the visible heavens and the earth. Verse number 12, the coming day of God. Verse number 13, the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Now, here's what I want to know. And I, no, nobody raising a hand. I'm asking you in your heart. Your pastor preached not long ago about the rapture. Remember how that used to thrill you? How you couldn't wait for the coming of the Lord? How you and your friends would jump up and laugh about rapture practice? You remember that? Now the preacher preaches on the rapture and you think, well, I, I hope he don't come before I get to spend some time with my grandbabies. I, I hope he doesn't come before the elections. I'm so excited about the election. Well, I, I hope he doesn't come before I get to graduate. I want to get my diploma. My, listen, what is it? What is it that started growing again in your life that Jesus once rooted out? And now it's robbed you of your joy and your anticipation and your hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says here, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot. Remember, remember, come on, I know, I know some of you just as right as you can be. But some of you, honestly, and no, no hands. Remember when you got saved, and if the preacher had said, God wants you to wear nothing but blue, you'd have thrown away everything in your closet wasn't blue. Because you wanted to be right with God. You wanted to please God. If, if, if the preacher had said, the Lord wants you to walk around with, with one eye covered and just see how, you, you say, well, I don't, I don't know why a preacher said that, but I sure want to do what God wants. Come on, some of us did some crazy things weren't even in the Bible. Because we wanted to be right with God. Some of us tried to do everything that was in the Bible, whether it was for a Jew or a Gentile or a warning to a lost man. It's just, with no dispensation, no rightly dividing, nothing. Just God said it. I believe it. That settles it. woo And now, well, I don't see why you could do that. Well, I think that's just legalism. Well, how come you got to have all these rules? Aren't we free in Christ? Don't you believe what's saved always saved? Oh, you just trying to make me feel guilty. Where did all that stuff come from? That's how you talked before you got saved. Your flesh has always talked that way. Your carnal mind has always thought that way. But I'm telling you, if you don't get that wall rebuilt, and you don't patch up those broken down places, everything in that world is going to flood into your vineyard or you're going to slip through that wall and go back out there that other side. Man, oh man, if we had the people in our church that used to sing their lungs out during a song service, that used to meet with me and pray and ask God to help them live on less so they could give more to missions. The people that used to, they, they would give up overtime to make sure they didn't miss visitation. Now they're out there in that world or they're in some lukewarm carnal outfit called a church that shouldn't be because it's not a church. So what happened? Well, they didn't stop believing in the Trinity. They don't deny the virgin birth. If they ever read a Bible, they just read the good old King James. Do you know what happened? One of their teenagers kicked down a part of the wall. And they knew if they rebuilt it, that sweet little 16-year-old would pitch a fit. So they just left it broken. One of their, one of their kinfolk got into sin and the preacher had to deal with it. And that busted out a piece of their wall. And they were so mad about it, they never rebuilt that. 
And then some things that they should have thrown out during that revival meeting when people were throwing things away, but they just put them in the closet. Started coming back out of the closet. Some magazines, some books, some music, some movies. They're not all that bad. They were when you were on fire for God. They were when Jesus was the most important thing in your life. But Hollywood's got a way of just kicking a piece of that wall down. You know why you young people, you know why you have a problem with us old people when it comes to music? I'm talking about the the world now. You know why? Because our flesh likes what it's always liked. It likes those dead singers. It likes those 70-year-old singers. That's who it liked when we were 10. That's who it liked when we were 40. That's who it liked when we were 70. The flesh. It never changes. You wonder why old people sit down and watch some old cowboy movies and those old Cary Grant movies and all that kind of stuff. That's just where their flesh got locked in. That flesh doesn't change. If you could live 500 years, your flesh would be no better when you were 499 than it is right now. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. If you don't root those briars up, they're taking over your life. If you don't keep those weeds pulled, they're taking over your life. If you don't constantly rebuild that wall, you are going to lose the sanctification that Jesus Christ gave you when you sold out and surrendered to Him. You better believe me. Some of the best people we ever had in our church are now some of the greatest enemies of our ministry on the face of this earth. And up here in their head, they still believe what they always believed. But their heart's full of bitterness, their heart's full of resentment, and their heart's full of carnality, and their heart's full of unforgiveness, and their heart's full of pride, and all that knowledge amounts to nothing. They could tell you how to plant a garden. They could tell you how to grow a vineyard. They could tell you how to build a wall. They just hadn't done it in ten years. Some of you could tell these upstarts a much better way to to go from house to house and knock on doors and give the gospel than what they're doing. They don't need you to tell them how you used to do it. They need you to get out there with them. Well, you know, back in my day, this is your day. If you're living and breathing, this is your day. Don't tell us how prayer meeting used to be. Come pray like you used to pray. Don't tell us how revival meetings used to be. Get excited like you used to get excited. Well, you know, the times are different. The times are no different. Everything you want to preach against that's going on today, you can get it in a book 2,000 years old. There's nothing happening today that God left out of the Bible. You want parades of sodomites? Genesis 19. You want men harming members of their own family? 1 Corinthians 5. It's all there. I don't care how depraved it is. It's been going on since Adam got kicked out of the garden. You want to talk about souls getting saved? They're still getting saved. You want to talk about prayers getting answered? They're still getting answered. You want to talk about light from the Scripture? God's still giving light from the Scripture. You just got to decide what you want to get in on. And, and, and if I can express one concern, it's not anything that's visibly happening. But God has, has blessed you tremendously. You have a pastor that loves God and loves you. His wife loves God and loves you. His family's in place. You have deacons that are true to the Word of God, true to the pastor, true to the work. You have, you have people here of all ages. What a good mix. Older people and young people and, and every, everywhere in between. You got a beautiful building. You got visitors coming in every week. And if you're not careful, All the spiritual effort that it took to get here, now that you're here, you're going to put your easy chair back, you're going to put your feet up, you're going to get a glass of tea in your hand, and just watch your garden grow. 
And you know what? It won't grow like that. This thing will become a weed patch if you lose your diligence. This thing will become one more big, beautiful, carnal, dead, compromised mess if you don't keep the briars out of here. That property looks good. But it's not going to maintain itself. The building looks good. But it's not going to maintain itself. But inside the building is the church. The people. And if you, if you lose your zeal for souls, if you lose your desire for growth, if you lose your hunger for new people, if you lose your hunger for conversions at this altar, if you lose your hunger for baptisms, there's only one way to go. You're going to go on or you're going to go back. You're not going to stay right here. And I, I, I plead with you, now that God has given you all this, numbers, ministries, property, do not have a yard sale and get rid of your garden tools. Do not have a yard sale and get rid of your wheelbarrow and your pickaxe. You've got to keep that wall strong. You got to keep your prayer life fervent. You got to stay in this book. You got to stay after souls. You can't be content with just letting God. Listen, people just gonna come in because you got a pretty building, and you got to think, well, I don't need to go visitation. I don't need to go witness. There's people coming in here every week. That doesn't keep your heart right. And what if everybody's heart is just like yours? For long, it's not a church, it's not a ministry, it's not a labor. It's just a place where we go to fellowship and eat and talk and gossip and, and, and exchange recipes and, and websites. And, and 15 years from now, it won't be Faith Baptist Church. It'll be the river at Mid Hill. You've got to stay diligent. You've got to stay steadfast. What got you here will keep you here. But if you don't keep doing what got you here, somebody's coming to visit. Let's finish up where we started. Come back to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Verse 34, poverty and want are traveling Proverbs 24, 34, so shall thy poverty come. Did you know, when the man planted the vineyard, poverty and want were coming? Did you know when the man put the wall around the vineyard, poverty and want were coming? Did you know when the man pruned the vines, poverty and want were coming? But there wasn't any way they were going to bring that man into ruin. Look how diligent, look how steadfast he's working in his field. Ah, but then I saw a little sleep. You know why that man took a little sleep? Poverty and want kept coming. Did you know while that man took a little slumber, poverty and want kept coming? Did you know just not a lot, just a little folding of the hands... Poverty and want kept coming. And step by step and day by day, it got closer and closer and closer and closer. And one day, it just walked right in and took over that man's vineyard. Brother, may I say to you, the zeal you once had Every day you are content to go without it. Spiritual poverty and spiritual want is one day closer to your heart. It's coming. It's not, it's not going to stop. It's coming. Brother, sister, I know, listen, some of you don't pray like you used to. And you know that. But you got so many people to pray for you. But I'm telling you every day, that you're content to not get your prayer life back where it was, spiritual poverty 
and spiritual want are one day closer. Listen, I don't want to, I don't want to bring up any, any hurtful, I don't, but I'm telling you, the people that have shocked you and broken your heart when they sat in churches just like ours and fell into adultery, that didn't happen in a week. It didn't even happen when they first locked eyes with each other. It didn't even happen when they began their flirtatious interaction. It began when one or both decided, that preaching isn't for me. It's for the other guy. I don't need to respond to that. I'm stronger than that. I don't need to deal with my heart. I, I, I'm, I'm truer to God than that. Listen, there's not a man sitting in church tonight, there's not a woman sitting in church tonight looking across the room at each other that intend to commit adultery. Nor do they intend to go to an altar and repent of what they're thinking and how they're feeling. And poverty is going to keep coming. It's going to keep coming. It's going to keep coming. It's going to keep coming. And one day, it's going to be right in the middle of your house. Young man, you know why we preach so hard at you? Young lady, you know why you think we just ride you mercilessly? Because it's true. You're not cussing. You're not drinking. You're not doing drugs. You're not pulling your clothes off and, hot, and, and doing all that stuff that other boys and girls do. But you know what we see? You're not memorizing Scripture. And you're not singing during the song service. And you're not praying in the prayer meeting. And you're not serious in Sunday school. And you're not paying attention when the preacher's preaching. And I'm telling you, we're not saying that you're full of the devil. We're saying the devil's coming! He's headed right for you and you're not building a wall. I can't believe it. She grew up in church and then... Boom! No, it's not then boom. It's a fuse that was lit years ago. It's moving closer and closer and closer and closer to that powder keg with every stupid comment on Facebook. And with every stupid song plugged in your ears that mom doesn't know you're listening to. And with every stupid friend you make that hates God. You can sit right here. You don't have to go out in the world. It's in your heart. What you got to do is weed it. What you got to do is chop the briars down. What you got to do is build a wall. Look, look what he says. We're almost done. Verse 34. So shall, no doubt about it, thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want. Now look, as an armed man. He's not armed. He doesn't have to be. You have been disarmed. He doesn't have to come with weapons because you are not prepared to oppose Him. Brother, sister, your pastor preaches the Bible, but you don't read it. Your pastor gives you Scripture for an hour or so here and an hour or so there, but you don't study it. You don't memorize it. Your church prays for you, but you don't pray. Your church goes out and tries to win the lost, but you don't witness to anybody. And when the devil shows up, you have no defense against him. He will take you without a roar. He will take you without a claw. He will take you without a tooth. You'll just get sight of Him and fall over at His feet. You're not prepared. I'm telling you, this Bible is not written to people who don't love God. It's written to people who do love God. 
And to those who love the Lord, he said, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand take heed, lest he fall. To people that love the Lord, he said, Ye did run well. What doth hinder you? To the people that love the Lord, he said, Who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Well, that could never happen to me. It's already happening, or you wouldn't say that. How's your wall compared to the time in your life when you were the most excited about Jesus? How clean is your vineyard compared to the time in your life when you were most excited about Jesus? How pure is your heart? How sanctified is your home compared to the time when you were most excited about Jesus? You know what revival is? It's getting back to that place. Have you grown content with a few weeds here and a few briars there and a few breaks in the wall? It's only going to get worse. If you don't maintain it, it will all fall apart. We need revival. If you are, listen, this is not, I'm, I'm not trying to get everybody at the altar, but I'm telling the truth. If there was a time in your life when you were more excited about Jesus, more interested in the Bible, more burdened for souls, more desirous of prayer than right now, your vineyard is suffering. Your wall is down. And that, that poverty He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's not going to stop. Wait for you to get ready. you got to get ready before He gets there. Come on, brother, before you lose your marriage. Come on, sister, before you lose your testimony. Come on, young people, before you go farther than you intend to go. Let's rebuild that wall. Let's clean up that vineyard. For that armed man, that, that man that, well, you don't even have to be armed. For that traveling man gets here with spiritual poverty and ruin. Fair enough? All right, let's stand to our feet as the pastor comes. Father, help me not to be a hypocrite. Lord, don't let me preach something I don't intend to live or to practice. Lord, may we, may we be diligent once again about purity, holiness, zeal, sanctification. Lord, where'd our burden for the lost go? Where'd our excitement over church go? Where did our hunger for Your Word go? God, revive us. Revive us again. Don't let this beautiful building distract us. Don't let this big congregation make us careless. Please, Lord, keep our hearts right. Before you, in Jesus' name we pray.